This is Thomas Clocky, and here's his story. He's a student at the University of Texas in Arlington. Now, according to the story, again, we're only getting one side of it, but it turns out that uh, Thomas was approached by a gay person at the university. He was basically propositioned. He said, thank you, but no thank you. The person who did the propositioning then went to the administration of the university and said that Thomas Clocky had basically put all kinds of anti-gay racial slurs and threatened his life and so on. Now, it turns out that the uh, student who did the initial uh, proposition, if it turns out that that is in fact the case, and I want to stress here again that this is just one side of the story that we hear, that person went to somebody they knew who was an associate vice president of student affairs named Heather Snow. Snow got together with an academic integrity official named Daniel Moore, and together they purposely kept the University of Texas at Arlington's uh, Title IX coordinator in the dark about the complaint. Title IX deals with a lot of these kind of student um, protests and student rules and so on and so forth. To make a long story short, all of Thomas Klotke's Title IX uh, protections were absolutely simply abandoned. They just plain were ignored, including things like he never was um, told that he was under Title IX investigation. He was uh, never told that, uh, that there was a, a student affairs official charging the thing. He, he was never told that um, that there had been a, a claim of um, physical assault that wasn't even made by the person who made the claim in the first place, and so on and so on and so on. We'll close this uh, introduction by saying that uh, prior to this event, Tom Klotke had no prior history of mental health and by all accounts, happy uh, young guy in college getting ready to go to grad school. But as it turns out, these accusations and the fact that there was no investigation whatsoever looked like it was gonna cost Thomas Klotke his uh, graduate uh, admission, and so Thomas Klotke killed himself. Now, what's the point of this story? I think the point of this story is pretty simply this. A gay person made an accusation of homophobia against a white person, made it to extremely left-wing people in the university's administration, and they were so sure that this was the case, or the, the personal relationship between the accuser and, and some of these uh, administration people was so tight, that his entire student rights, such as they are, were absolutely ignored. And I cannot imagine that anything happening the other way would have been possibly contemplated like this. There's no way that, it, that, that if these claims had been made the other way, it would just simply would have been ignored. So in a nutshell, here's basically what I'm trying to say. There was a time in this country when um, gay people, black people, and so on were intimidated, and so on, and so on, and so forth, and they were not believed if a white person made a charge against a black person, you believe the white person. If a straight person made a charge against the gay person, you believe the straight person, because these other people were ostracized by society. Scott, it is absolutely important to the justice of this nation that everybody's accusations be taken seriously. No one, no, certainly none of us, want to go back to a world where a white person's word or a straight person's word supersedes the word of, of somebody who isn't one of those things. But I think that that goes just as well in reverse and that, that this entire idea of political correctness has gotten to the point now where it's becoming fatal. It, it seems like nobody can just grab the frickin' pendulum and say, stop. I mean, stop. it seems like it, it swings to one extreme and then it swings to the other extreme and whoever you know has the sort of position of societal power, whether that be actual uh, power, nominal power, where you're, you know, because of your title, or just power in the culture because of the overwhelming narrative of the culture, that we have to use it to the to the degradation of others. That we can't simply stop and say, "Wait a minute, let's knock it out ahead of the facts. Let's give this person their due process rights." And I know someone watching this who comes from a, an, another perspective will look at this and say, "Hey, you know, you're finally getting your comeuppance, boys. Uh, you deserve this after 150 years or whatever." it's been of you doing the same thing to other minorities. It's about time you got yours. Well, frankly, it was wrong when we were doing it. We, you know, my pro progenitors, my ancestors. It's wrong now. And having, uh, you know, revenge instead of justice is never right. And the great spokespeople for uh, civil rights have always said what I'm saying. And yet somehow we don't hear that message. We just hear, I'm going to get mine. I'm going to get the leg up on the others. And when I have the advantage, I'm going to make them pay for it. I mean, this is, I, I don't think that the administration or even the individual who, made, who originally made the, the proposition to this, uh, this kid that killed himself uh, are accountable for his death. 
yet they are accountable for their behavior and they're accountable for the uh, the abortion of justice that this has become and if if not in academia where are we supposed to teach and learn what justice really means you know you said something i think that's really needs to be said can't be said enough this idea of revenge is social justice it's the entire idea of social justice is essentially revenge is a case where somebody is accusing me of doing something that I didn't do, and they're claiming that they are the victims of X that, that they weren't the victims of. These injustices cannot be undone by new injustices. I wasn't a slaveholder, and I didn't enslave anybody, so you don't get to take it out on me. It doesn't even matter if my father was a slaveholder. The sins of the father are not visited upon the son. Steve, will, you, will there ever be an end to this, do you think? I mean, there's got to be a point when people, I think maybe the election of Donald Trump might be an indication that we are past peak political correctness, because this kind yeah. of thing is absolutely out of control. And I sometimes think it's getting worse, but I also sometimes think there's a, there's a signal underneath that noise saying that people have basically had enough of this kind of nonsense. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting to detect that same thing. And uh, the election of Donald Trump, I think, was uh, uh, more of a symptom of this, 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 corre- this course correction. Than, uh, than a cause. But listen, you know, uh, my mom was a hairdresser in the 70s. Half of her uh, friends and co-workers were gay. I, I spent my high school years living in St. Louis's Central West End, which is the gay part of town. And after that, I lived in San Francisco in Northern California. And so back then, half my friends were uh, either gay by or experimenting, which was always just confusing as hell. But we all got along. I don't really see what happened here as a, a gay versus straight thing. What we're, what we're seeing, and it's especially true on campus, you got to remember that the campus Campuses are going to be have to be dragged kicking and screaming along this course correction, but it's the politicalization of sex. Look, we know what the left does. It does divide and conquer. It's uh, it's whites versus blacks versus Hispanics versus Asians. It's gay versus straight. It's men versus women. It's divide and conquer, and we're seeing this now on a very personal level. Hitting on people. I mean, this is how we meet people. This is how we we, we we go on dates. This is how we get married and fall in love. And and now the the progressives have managed to politicize even that as uh, as a part of their divide and conquer story. And it's it's straight out of George Orwell's 1984 book with the Junior Anti Sex League. And and it, it it's it, it it's the imposition of control at the most fundamental human level. And gosh, I don't know if we're going to be able to stop this pendulum like right at that midpoint like Scott was just talking about, but I think it's up to all of us to try. And the first step in that is to say no, not to say uh, 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 no to each other, although when we do have to say no to each other, let's, let's do so gently, but to say no to this idea that somebody in an ivory tower, that somebody in, uh, in, in, a, uh, in a Washington office building knows what's best for you and me and our love lives. Well, I think going away from it, there's no question that this uh, story happened because a gay person accused a straight person of homophobia. I personally think that that kind of accusation is bait that administrators like the ones involved here simply cannot resist. Oh, yeah. The reason I say this is because when they don't find evidence of homophobia or racism or whatever, they will, in fact, manufacture it. We remember people going to, from the left saying, we have to go to Tea Party events with racist signs to show everybody how racist the Tea Party is. And it's a little tough for us because none of them are carrying any racist signs or, yeah. or saying anything that's, uh, that's actually racist. So I think it was ir- ir- um, absolutely ir- unresist- irresistible bait for the left-wingers to say, aha, here's our chance for some social justice, let's get in on this, and therefore deprive this uh, young man of all of his rights and, and caused him to, to kill himself. I think what you said, Steve, about dividing people up is, is act- actually what the left does, and strangely enough and paradoxically enough, I think the conservatives divide people up even further. I think we divide people up as finely as they can be divided, as a matter of fact. I, I think we divide you. people all the way into individuals. So when people ask me, well, what do you think about gay people, Bill? Well, I grew up in the theater department. I was surrounded by gay people. What do you think about gay people? My response is, which one are you talking yes, about? Right. Yeah. Who are you talking about? What do you mean? How can I make a judgment like that? What do I think of gay people? I know some wonderful gay people. I've known some horrible, horrible gay people. And this is the essence of what we're talking about. That injustice done against Thomas Clocky does not undo anything. It's just more injustice, it's more pain, and it's more just plain evil out there in the world. 
the way to get rid of injustice is through justice. And justice is an individual act between the law and the individual who has been harmed. And that's just that simple. And until we get back to that point, we're going to continue to have this kind of nightmare society where everything you say or do is going to be based on whether you're gay or straight, black or white, male or female. And this is not only not America, it's not civilization. It's got to go. For everybody here at BillWhittle.com, thanks very much for joining us. We'll see you next time.